in the webinar, I'm letting people in. So Shay, I have no idea. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Hello everybody, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, we're letting people in. Uh, on laisse les gens rentrer, donc ça sera pas long. Uh, quelques, min quelques minutes avant de commencer. A, little, a couple of minutes before we start. Hello, everybody. Bonjour tout le monde. We're just letting people come in. So there's still a, a lot of people coming into the, to the webinar. We'll start in about a minute. So. Donc, bonjour, hello, hola. Uh, I, it's Julie Soleil, I'm from l'AIDQ, one of the host organizations of Stimulus with the CDPC and the CAPUD. Uh, and CAPUD. Uh, just before we start, uh, I will hand off to Sophie, uh, who is doing the vocal sim uh, simultaneous interpretation today for the first time. So this is the first time you're actually going to hear somebody in your ears and it's not going to be written. We're trying this new thing out. Donc, je vais passer la parole à Sophie. On va faire l'interprétation vocale. C'est la première fois que Stimulus se fait ça. Et donc, Sophie va, va, va commencer. En bas dans votre écran, vous avez euh, interprétation. Vous pouvez soit le fermer, soit avoir anglais, soit avoir français. You can, on, on the bottom of your screen, you have an interpretation uh, button. You can choose English or French or not. If you're bilingual, don't choose any of the, the, the different things and you'll hear. And Sophie is going to start in French. So everybody, uh, you can choose the French or the English, whichever one, and uh, she'll start talking. And so I'm passing it off to Sophie. So people switch to English if you want to hear. Now she talked to the Franco uh, to the people speaking French. Now uh, people uh, put the ones that want to hear her. You'll hear her in English. If it's off, you if it's off, you won't hear her. If you don't choose a language, you can't hear her. You have to choose one or the other. I'm sorry I didn't say that at the beginning. It's her first time. So I'll let uh, Sophie go on the English channel and she'll tell you how this is all going to work for the people that because we'll have French and English presentations today. So if you don't speak French, you're going to need that. So I pass it on to Sophie.
So just to recap a little bit, so make sure if you want to hear Sophie in, in French and if you to translate, put yourself on the French channel and then on the English channel for the English and you can switch it. Uh, those kind of things. Um, so I will let Jessica, can you uh, look at the chat and answer the questions? And I will start uh, uh, with the land uh, recognition. I am talking to you from my home in the Eastern townships of Quebec, uh, <clears throat> which is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki people and the Wibanaki Confederacy. I also recognize that Quebec has more than 50 communities on its territory, and also that the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities whose traces have marked these lands for generations. I also want to recognize that when we choose speakers, we try to have different speakers from all over Canada, from urban to rural, from Francophone and Anglophone, different genders, and from the BIPOC communities and people with lived experience. But we don't always succeed in having all of this diversity. But I want to say that we are trying to do this and let us know if anyone in your community that we should be connecting with, it, it, it would be a, a great way of uh, knowing and, and getting to know other people in different communities all over Canada. Of course, with the subject today, uh, we, will be take, we will be talking uh, about, uh, we also need to reflect on the thousands of lives that we have lost due to the toxic drug supply in North America. We are in the throes of a second or even a third wave of this crisis. And since COVID, the deaths have spiked to numbers we have never seen before. Let's take a few seconds of silence for all the people we have lost and to all the amazing people supporting them and their families. Thanks everyone. Now I will let, uh, I will let Rebecca Penn, who is gonna be the moderator of this uh, uh, webinar, uh, start the whole process and then you'll start meeting all the different people that are going to be talking. So me, I'm going to be on the tech side. I'm going to be taking care of the chat and the questions. And so I am going to close my camera. And, and Julie you. Soleil. Yes. I'm wondering before we start, I'm wondering if, um, can you share the screen to show where on Zoom the, uh, the English I'm not sure if you can do that. <laughs> um, uh, it's, it's, it's interpretation on the bottom of your screen. There's an interpretation thing. And then you just choose off English or French. Everybody should have that in the bottom of their screen. There's an interpretation. There's a closed caption thing. There's everybody, yeah. But on, on the participant side, est-ce que c'est correct? Est-ce que y a des problèmes? Does not everybody have it on the other side? You have to click, yes, you have to click on the interpretation and then you click on English or French. There should well, be. The, the closed captioning, you guys shouldn't have it because we did not start it. We just did the interpretation. Sorry, it, it's bound to happen because it's our first, uh, it's our first thing. Le dernier icon est quitté. I'm not on the other side. Uh, maybe Jessica, I can throw you on the other side and you can go look and then I can, bring you back and then we'll get we'll get this organized and you Rebecca you can start the process and we'll figure it out okay yeah okay yeah let me start just start by introducing myself I'm Rebecca Penn and um, I work with the safer opioid supply programs in Toronto and um, also facilitate a safer opioid supply community of practice. Uh, I'm really glad to be here today. Um, thank you so much for inviting me um, to the organizing committee. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. And I hope we can get, uh, everyone can um, get access to this uh, new way of doing the translation, the interpretation. It's great that Sophie is, is able to do this for us. Um, so let's just start with some quick housekeeping um, and fitting from with what we're just working through right now uh, with learning about how to do this interpretation simultaneously uh, translation. Um, we ask that everyone comes to us today with an attitude of patience, kindness, and humor. 
So we are trying something new and things, sometimes there's hiccups, unstable technology, and um, it's not the same doing Zoom meetings and conferences as it is being in a room together, but uh, let's all work together to create a really safe space here uh, for us to engage in some really important conversations. So a couple things to note, um, again, the English and French simultaneous uh, translation and interpretation. I need to remind myself right at this moment to speak slowly so we can give um, a Sophie time to, to do the simultaneous uh, interpretation. And also we'll take a moment between the speakers so that Sophie can switch gears from English to French. Um, Want to let you know um, that we're using the hashtag uh, stimulus webinar. So if you're using Twitter, you can use stimulus hashtag stimulus webinar. Um, you will also find. Hello. Oh, Julie, I'm going to mute you. There you are. Um, you also find uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you'll see there's the mute, stop video, participants, chat. Um, there's also a Q&A. I want you to find the Q&A. That's where you can ask questions for our panelists. Um, and those will be, uh, the, the questions and answers will be um, moderated by Julie Soleil and Jessica. Um, and um, we're going to, we're gonna keep track of the, the, Q the questions that you ask and we will bring them up to, at the end of after all of our speakers have um, presented. Um, if you do want to present or ask an anonymous question, you can change your name. Um, if you go to, where is it, Julie? Sole, uh, the drop down options by your name, um, it's in the top right corner, and you can rename yourself there as anonymous. And yes, we're going to review all the questions after all the panelists have spoken. Uh, there's also a chat section, which some of you are using right now, um, that is also going to be monitored by um, Julie Soleil and Jessica. And Shay is also here to moderate the Facebook Live, so you can catch us there as well. Um, this event is being recorded. It's uh, going to be available on the Stimulus website next week with the PowerPoints and um, other references and other materials. So I wanna just take a moment to say thank you to everyone who was involved in making this event happen today. Lots of people working away in the background. We've got uh, Marilyn from AIDQ, uh, Vanessa and Peter who are communications at AIDQ and CDPC, uh, Jessica, Julie Soleil, and Shai, thank you so much for helping out on all the different aspects uh, to go into making this happen. Um, LEDQ in partnership with Caput and CDPC, uh, they've been growing stimulus. Uh, it's been a, a project with many different aspects to it. And many of you also already know the Stimulus Connect, but the Stimulus webinar is a new part of, um, of this uh, program. Um, and the goal is there to be reaching a broader population. Um, and the webinars are to set the set an opportunity for us all to come together and talk about some complex issues and give you some information about different concepts and, and different work that's happening. So thank you everyone for being here. Um, we've got a lot of people. Let me give you some quick statistics before we get to our presentations. There's 212 people who have signed up uh, from across the country. 73% are women. Um, we have people from lots of different professions, outreach, peer workers, managers that support community organizations. There's researchers, students, professors, teachers. We've got nurses, social workers, psychologists, probation officers, policymakers, and government workers. It's great to see this kind of cross sectoral uh, participation in this topic. 38% of our, of our attendees are from Quebec. 13% from BC, 29% from Ontario, uh, but we also have people here from other provinces and territories, um, and even people from outside of Canada. Uh, there's people who come from Edinburgh, Quito, uh, the United States, United Kingdom, Slovenia, Sweden, 
Um, and uh, yeah, lots of people. Welcome, welcome. Um, so we have some great presentations. So let's get started. Um, oh, or we, we, first. yeah, just just before uh, we uh, because stimulus is now uh, being uh, funded and things like that, we do need to have some statistics of the people that actually come. So those were the people who signed up, but we need a little poll. So I'm going to throw in a poll here. And there's four questions. Uh, and hopefully all of you will be able to answer because this is very helpful for us also. So I am going to uh, launch the polling and it's anonymous, of course, and I will give you the, the different statistics after. Give it a couple more seconds and then uh, we'll go. A minute always seems so long, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm always like, wow, it's only a minute. Uh, Silence is hard for me anyway. I need to work on silence, yes. We're almost finished. Uh, there's uh, about 20% of people that are still coming in, so I'm gonna let it go through. Okay, so I'm gonna end the polling. Thank you everyone for participating in the polling. It is well, maybe I can share, share re results and see if people wanna know where everybody are from, just fast, fast, fast. Uh, so we can see that there's people from a lot of different places. We couldn't put all the provinces because there's only 10, 10 choices. So we had to put the Maritimes together and things like that. But we can see that Quebec, Ontario, Manitoba, Alberta and British Columbia are pretty pre present. English and French, huh? it's half and half, which is nice to see. And uh, we're reaching both communities. And then we have people from the BIPOC communities, uh, community organizations, a lot of a lot of people with used experience and things like that, public health, health services and things like that. So awesome. So I will let the, the, the presenters and uh, Rebecca continue. And I'm going to close and I won't be here until the end. Thanks, Teresa. Okay, so we have four people with us today with uh, some great presentations to share. Let's start off with some introductions. Um, Dominique, would you like to introduce yourself? Great, can you hear me? How's my audio? Great, awesome. So my name is Dominique Denis Lalonde. Uh, I'm an RN in Calgary, and I also identify as a person who uses drugs. I'm currently working on my master's um, at the University of Calgary, and I'm focusing on the conceptualization of harm reduction. So how people think of this concept, what it means to different people. My, um, my background has been in education, especially in sexual health, uh, HIV work, sex work advocacy, harm reduction, obviously. Uh, and I've done that in a variety of settings, including clinical settings, as well as outreach, um, and uh, some music festivals and mass gatherings. So I um, am really excited to be sharing my work with you today. I will say that I have a two-month-old and a three-year-old in the house with me right now. So if I need to turn off my screen, that is why. Thanks, Dominique. Shana, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce myself now because I 
introduce myself and doing my land acknowledgement in my presentation, but my name is Shauna Ilsley. Um, also answer to Shauna or to Shohan or to show um, based on the spelling of my name. I am here in Manitoba. Um, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about how the organization, the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network has uh, incorporated nothing about us without us into the organization. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that because I do have a bit more introduction in my presentation. Thank you. Happy to be here. Chantal. Oui, bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Uh, alors, mon nom est Chantal Perron. Uh, moi, aussi, moi aussi, je vais me présenter uh, plus uh, en détail dans ma présentation tout à l'heure. Donc, uh, je suis une utilisatrice de drogue uh, par le passé. Et puis maintenant, et puis je suis aussi une militante euh, et je travaille à l'organisation Métadame, qui est une, une organisation par et pour les personnes qui consomment, qui ont déjà consommé des opioïdes. Donc, euh, c'est une des rares euh, organisations qui est entièrement par et pour au Québec. On est peut-être deux, trois. Euh, et le reste, je vais en parler plus en détail tantôt. Et je suis de Montréal aussi. Ça fait plaisir. Merci de m'avoir invité à la journée. Merci, Chantal. Et Guillaume? Oui, bonjour. Euh, mon nom est euh, Guillaume Tremblay. Moi aussi, euh, je suis de l'organisation Métadame. Euh, donc, euh, moi aussi, je suis de Montréal, mais aujourd'hui, je suis euh, dans les cantons de l'Est, comme Julie Soleil. En fait, on se promène beaucoup là, dans le cadre de, de Profane. On va vous en, va expliquer un petit peu plus en détail euh, qu'est-ce qui en retourne tantôt. Euh, je suis une personne qui a eu euh, qui a une expérience vécue avec l'usage de substances avec aussi, euh, j'ai dû aussi composer avec euh, des troubles concomitants. Euh, j'ai euh, utilisé des substances pendant plus de 25 ans. Là, ça fait quatre ans que je suis complètement abstinent par choix, mais aussi par nécessité, mais, mais par choix. Tu sais, en fait, c'est tout le temps un choix, cette affaire-là. Donc, euh, je, vais, euh, je vais tenter tout à l'heure de vous un peu, de vous brosser un tableau euh, euh, de, de qu'est-ce que c'est être... Euh, un père dans la réduction des méfaits via un programme de formation. Puis euh, c'est un peu ça notre, notre objectif, moi puis Chantal aujourd'hui. Voilà. Merci, Guillaume. OK. Dominique, let's, let, let me uh, pass it to you to take it off. Just going to share my screen here and we'll get started. Okay, hi everyone. Um, so as I mentioned before, I've been studying harm reduction and how it's conceptualized. Um, so this webinar, this is a shortened version of the results of the work that um, I did last year and that I published with some of my colleagues at the UFC, uh last year. So I did a concept analysis, which is a whole methodology. If you're interested in knowing more about the methodology, I invite you to read the paper. Um, it's a bit dry reading, I will be honest, um, but some people like that. Um, but there's also an option of watching the more complete webinar of this um, information, which is posted on the Stimulus website. Um, and it's one that I did with the Harm Reduction Nurses Association earlier this year. So it provides a little bit more context um, and more detail and discussion about some of the information I'll be presenting to you today. The paper is also posted there. Um, so if you are interested in that, you'll have to access it there because otherwise it's behind a paywall, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so we'll get started. So I thought that this was a really good quote to start with. Um, it was written 25 years ago, but I feel like it's still pretty accurate right now. Uh, and it's what led me to do this analysis in the first place. I was finding that the term harm reduction was being used in all sorts of different ways. And it made it really difficult to know what someone was talking about when they say something is harm reduction. So for example, harm reduction housing, for some people that seemed to mean that the people living there had to abstain from drugs or should abstain from drugs and alcohol, but that they wouldn't be kicked out of their housing if they were caught using. 
Whereas for other folks, harm reduction housing implies that people are allowed to use in their homes and the safety of their homes, thus allowing to, them to remain housed. Um, so those are two very different strategies, clearly. So this led me to wondering, like, what does harm reduction really mean? Can we clarify this concept at all? That seems like something that would be worthwhile um, for many people. So in this webinar, we are going to talk about the key attributes that came out of um, my analysis. I don't call them principles because generally principles are something that um, you know, a group of people agree that these should be our principles and then they work from there. I did the opposite process where I looked at everything that has been published. Um, so academic literature as well as websites um, and books as well. And I took that information and took these attributes from that. So I'm hoping that this will provide a point of reference for folks in all different areas to plan and implement harm reduction and also advocate for it on a variety of levels. I will be focusing more on the theory or philosophy of harm reduction rather than specific examples because I know that Guillaume, uh, Chantal and Shauna will cover those. Um, they have excellent examples of how, how harm reduction can look in practice. So in my analysis, I identified these seven key attributes of harm reduction, which we will discuss them all in, in greater depth. Some of you may know that in the last few years, several authors and groups have developed their own harm reduction principles or characteristics. And you might be familiar with some of them, such as Harm Reduction International, the Harm Reduction Coalition, and then there's a few uh, scholars as well who have um, put forth a few principles. And what's interesting is that they all have similarities to the ones that I've come up with, and they have differences as well. Um, as such, I do want to emphasize that this isn't like the blueprint or like the be all end all of what harm reduction is. It's more of a summary or like a snapshot of what harm reduction is based on where we've come so far. Um, harm reduction in the literature has only been around for about 30 years as the term harm reduction. Um, so things have evolved over that time and I fully expect that they're gonna to continue to evolve as well uh, based on changing community needs and changing policies as well. So I feel like it's, it's useful to have this here and now snapshot so that harm reduction doesn't just become some political buzzword um, that lacks meaning and so that it can continue to affect positive change and outcomes for people who use drugs and their families and communities. So let's go get through these, um, start looking at them. So the first one, which was totally unanimous, in the literature is a focus on harms. So that is, we are focusing on reduction of harm rather than reduction of use of drugs. So an abstinence approach cannot be considered harm reduction because it would aim for reduction of use rather than of harm. So I'll say that again, an abstinence approach, a program that aims to help people to abstain from drugs cannot be considered harm reduction. And this was pretty unanimous in the literature, though I think probably there's some people who disagree with me. Um, so for example, the just say, uh, just say no to drugs, right? So this image here on the right, uh, perhaps from the D.A.R.E. program, for some of you might have had that in school, but that would be an abstinence approach and, and it's not harm reduction. It doesn't provide any factual information about the actual harms of drugs and how to reduce those harms. It just aims to tell kids not to use drugs at all. Um, so a focus on harms on an individual level might mean supporting a client or patient to switch their mode of administration. So from injecting to, to smoking, um, since that's generally a safer rate of administration of their drug. And then on a larger scale, it means providing factual evidence-based education to let's say use in schools rather than just telling them to not use drugs at all. So that's the first one. This second one 
um, is actually just emerging in the literature, which is hard to imagine, especially when we have fantastic peer peer led groups um, doing this work right now. But the participation of people who use drugs in harm reduction is somewhat new uh, in the literature. So it puts a strong value on the peer approach and outreach and that people who use drugs should be involved, if not leading all aspects of harm reduction planning, implementation, and even evaluation. So um, this phrase, nothing about us without us, you know, is used by a lot of drug user groups, though the phrase itself is, is much older than that historically as well. So this attribute wasn't found in the earlier literature, but it is becoming more prevalent now, but this might be why this particular attribute is still missing from harm reduction programming today in some places, um, just because it is still emerging. So this next one is inconsistent in the literature. And by inconsistent, I just mean that the language used to describe this attribute is not consistent. It's kind of all over the map. But there's always a lot of talk about dignity and respect and self-determination, autonomy. Um, these things are all mentioned frequently, as well as you, treating people who use drugs as humans rather than as criminals. And so these are humanistic values um, and they're aligned with, with human rights. And um, thus, this is a, a key part of harm reduction as well, even though it might not uh, be spoken about directly in those terms. So this next one should come as no surprise to anyone, um, but the public health approach. The literature strongly emphasized that harm reduction is a public health approach that prevents disease, promotes health, um, recognizes the role of the socioeconomic determinants of health in the health of a population. So what does that all mean? You know. <laughs> so we recognize that harm reduction was really born in the HIV AIDS crisis uh, in order to prevent transmission of HIV. So this also means that harm reduction is part of a continuum of care, it's not a standalone solution, it's not the silver bullet. Um, it also includes prevention and education and treatment and follow-up. As we know in Canada, this angle, this public health angle has been really consistently used to garner support for uh, harm reduction, which is interesting because harm reduction has fairly anarchistic you know, roots, uh, but we'll get there as well. So this one was probably the most contentious of the attributes that I identified. And I think it's the one that's changing the most rapidly as well. And that's the value, neutrality and non-judgment about drug policy, laws, uh, morals around drug use and what the long-term goals should be. So some harm reduction advocates will avoid the moral questions about drug use. You know, is it right, is it wrong? Um, and we'll avoid questions about what the role of the government should be in preventing or interfering with drug use. Because historically, harm reduction has maintained a mostly neutral stance towards drug policy uh, and the criminalization of drug users. So this might have been to avoid political tension. You know, let's not take a political angle. Let's just take the public health angle and leave out the politics. And by avoiding that political tension, they could garner more support. So the, several authors discuss that this is both a strength and a limitation of harm reduction, right? While we can remain neutral and kind of not ruffle anyone's feathers, it also impedes the social impact of harm reduction because those broader systemic issues and goals haven't been defined. And so now supporters, as we're seeing are no longer neutral on these topics. So we're hearing about decriminalization. We're talking about safe supply. Um, so, you know, it's clear that people who support harm reduction are now taking on some of these bigger issues and are no longer neutral about, you know, what the role of the government should be. 
Um, so value neutrality towards and non-judgment towards people who use drugs continues to be really uh, a fundamental part of harm reduction. So that's this idea of meeting people where they're at, which you know means leaving your own values and morals aside about that person's behavior or, or lifestyle and leaving that aside for a moment so that you can provide non-judgmental care and support to the person. So that was quite unanimous, um, but it's sort of these larger issues that are still debated in the literature. Another attribute that was consistent in the literature is that harm reduction is practical and pragmatic. So it's practical in the sense that it's a realistic response to an immediate need in the community. Um, and it's pragmatic in that it's sensible without concerning itself with any particular policy or ideology. So it's recognizing that something needs to happen and then doing it. And I think it's important to note that sometimes this means doing things that are not entirely legal and that are not you know, sanctioned by the government, such as overdose prevention sites that have popped up you know, they're a practical response to the immediate need for such services in those communities. So this image here is from the Moss Park overdose prevention site uh, in Toronto in 2017. Another example would be when Vandu, the Vancouver area network of drug users, established an unsanctioned legal distribution service uh, in Vancouver in 2001. It was practical and pragmatic and a quite effective response to the HIV crisis that was occurring amongst injection drug users in the downtown east side. They knew it would help, they knew it needed to be done, and despite it not being legal, they did it anyway. And what's interesting to note is that harm reduction has roots in anarchy. It, it has for a long time, and it's only in the last um, few decades that it's become government supported. Um, so I find that quite interesting as well, right? We're navigating these sort of two opposing forces of anarchy uh, and government policy. So the last attribute, which was also really consistent in the literature, is that harm reduction is constantly evolving to meet the needs of people who use drugs. It's adaptive, it's innovative. So, um, an example would be that uh, in one of the needle distributions that I've worked in, a lot of our clients didn't want to provide us their real name for stigma and whatnot. Um, so we had to come up with a way of tracking our service users because of funding and reporting without using real names. So they were able to pick any name that they wanted to and as long as they reused that same name. So we had a couple celebrities using our needle distribution, Michael Jackson, Jesus as well. Um, but kind of reducing that barrier for those clients. Another great example of harm reduction innovation is these are these images here on the left, which is from a mobile supervised consumption service that was developed. This one's in Calgary, but they also exist um, in several other places. Because we recognize that, especially in Calgary, people who use drugs and who would benefit from the service didn't all live in a centralized location as they might in other cities. And so this was an approach that could bring this service to where it was most needed. And then we had the flexibility to adjust the location and hours even as needed. Um, I say we could because this service unfortunately isn't currently running due to our provincial government limitations. I find it interesting, um, this, this line here at the bottom of the slide that Harm reduction has been said to be a living document, you know, where, where practice can adapt to accommodate the community, the changing community needs. So as such, harm reduction will, what harm reduction will look like will vary a lot by context, location, and community. And this is particularly true for rural and remote areas. So because of this, it might be difficult for policy to keep up with these emerging practices, which makes it difficult in turn for the funders to accept changes and deviations from what is like established harm reduction practice, because it's always changing. So it's hard to keep up. So here again, we have an attribute that is both a strength, of course, 
but it also presents some challenges because there's no single way to enact harm reduction. All right, so if we're doing all right for time, um, now that we've reviewed these seven attributes, I do have a model case, so an example that is fic fictional, but based on some of my, um, my personal experiences. And as we're listening to this, you'll notice that the seven key attributes come up. And some of them are really obvious, some of them are more subtle, some of them come up more than once. Um, so it's not to say that every occasion of harm reduction will include all these attributes, but there should definitely be a few. So I invite you in to listen. I'm sorry if the audio is terrible because it's coming through my, my AirPods, but at least you'll be able to read it as well. So let's listen here. Dominique, we don't have any sound, uh, any, any of us, so we could just read it. Just Yeah, sorry, I tried to figure that out, but... No oh, problem. Using the sterile equipment provided, ah, a nurse yeah. approaches with a wheelchair, and since he often falls asleep after injecting, kindly offers it to him so he can be moved aside for monitoring, so the booth becomes available to the next client. Jeff is feeling irritable as he has not injected in many hours and begrudgingly obliges. The nurse is not bothered by this, and noticing that he is quite shaky, offers to help Jeff prepare his equipment for self-injection. Jeff declines and mutters, I should have done this hours ago, when my buddy offered his needle. The nurse gives him a gentle smile and says, I'm glad you came here instead, and packs him a small bag of sterile injection supplies that she offers to him just in case. Jeff injects his dose and promptly dozes off. The nurse moves him to another location, watching him closely for signs of overdose. 20 minutes later, Jeff awakens and prepares to leave. The nurse asks if she can take a quick look at his veins for infection. And as she does this, Jeff asks how long it takes to get started on opioid replacement therapy and if people are successful with it. The nurse answers his questions and the peer worker offers to connect him to a local group of people with a history of drug use called Grateful or Dead that meet monthly to share stories, provide outreach, pick up discarded needles, and advocate for policy changes. Jeff says he will consider this, and as he is leaving, the nurse invites him to return. I hope that helps to put some of these ideas together. Um, and yeah, sorry about the voiceover issue at the beginning. So I have some final thoughts here before I pass it on to Shauna um, or, or Guillaume, whoever's going next. And it's just that harm reduction has come a long ways. Um, you know, it has its official debut 30 years ago and it's been evolving steadily since then. And I think it's gonna continue to do so, so long as the harms of drug use proliferate. And we know that the harms of drug use aren't going anywhere anytime soon, unfortunately, because prohibition as a drug policy is alive and well. So that being said, I hope that it helps to have a greater understanding of harm reduction so that we can prevent it from becoming a buzzword that lacks meaning and um, or from becoming something that's so poorly understood that it loses support. I would love to hear thoughts on what the future of harm reduction should look like and what you've perhaps observed related to what harm reduction is and isn't. So thanks for listening. Thanks, Dominique. Thank you all. If you have any questions, you can put them in the question and answer um, box. 
Um, and uh, we're going to switch over to Shannon now. Uh, this is also going to be a presentation in English. Um, okay, thank you, Shana. Do you want to take it away? Sure. I'm just setting up to share my screen. Give me one second here. Uh, is it? Can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, I'm going to put it into present mode. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's afternoon here. I know it's not necessarily afternoon everywhere yet. Um, so I, I, before I get into introducing myself, I just want to acknowledge the title of um, our harm reduction workshop and, and how we talk about harm reduction. Um, and this is kind of um, in line with why we were, you know, the title of the actual webinar here is that uh, many years ago, we had a previous administration and during that time, harm reduction really became synonymous with um, supply distribution and safe injection sites as that previous administration went after um, insight. And so um, being someone from Northern Manitoba and recognizing that harm reduction is so much more than just um, supply distribution, it was important for us to start thinking about and, and even naming our uh, workshop differently. It used to be called harm reduction and now it's harm reduction 2.0 beyond the needle. Um, recognizing that uh, supply distribution isn't, you know, an absolute component to work from a, a harm reduction model. And in fact, um, there's more harm reduction happens than supply distribution programming happens. And so, um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that. So who am I? My name, like I said earlier, is Shawnee Ilsley. My spirit name is Sacred Bear. And I was given my spirit name in a Uweepi ceremony uh, many years ago by one of our knowledge keepers, David Blacksmith, uh, who comes from Northern Manitoba himself. And uh, I was actually given my name um, from Contrary Spirit, and so I need to honor that. My pronouns are she and her, and uh, I was raised in Indigenous lands in Northern Manitoba. And the caretakers of those lands were the Inuinu, or sorry, the Inu, the Anishinu, the Dene, and the Inuit. And so my home fires burn in. Uh, the Paw Manitoba, Opaskwiak Cree Nation, uh, and Churchill Manitoba. So those are the communities that raised me. And in our organization, when we do our land acknowledgements, we always start with situating who we are and the spaces that um, raised us and took care of us and fed our spirits um, that helped us to become the people we are today. And so in doing that, I always have to acknowledge the water because I come from um, some of the most pristine water in the world. So um, up by the Paw and Ocean is what's called Clearwater Lake and it's one of the top three cleanest lakes in the world. Uh, and then I also come from um, the land that's connected to the Hudson Bay, uh, which of course in acknowledging these bodies of water, I also have to acknowledge the animals um, that have been there to take care of that uh, water along with the um, Indigenous caretakers. And so I always acknowledge the beluga, the polar bear, um, the many, many birds, uh, as well as all of the swimmers that uh, have taken care of these lands or these waters as well. So my home communities or the communities that my family settled in are signatories to Treaty 5. So I just wanna acknowledge that I acknowledge the land and the people and the animals before I acknowledge the treaty territory. And we do that because the treaties are the colonial identification of the land um, in, in some parts of Canada, uh, but the people in the land and the caretakers were there long before the treaties and, and the signatories to the treaty showed up. And so uh, in the communities that I came from, two of those communities are signatories to Treaty 5. Uh, treaty 5 is our biggest geographical treaty in the province, but it has the smallest population um, of all of our treaties. And so uh, in acknowledging the treaties, we acknowledge the non-Indigenous communities that signed those treaties because those are the communities that um, made a promise to share their resources. Um, and share the resources uh, in a really kind and generous and um, loving way with these 31 First Nations communities. And what we know is that the um, non-Indigenous communities did not uphold their end of the bargain. And so, uh, and had they upheld their end of the bargain, then 
these two lists of communities would look the same when we think of access to resources like health or education or economy, uh, and that's not the case. And so we know that um, um, some ends of these communities did not uphold their, their um, promises. And it's important for us to acknowledge that when we think about um, harm reduction, because the truth of the matter is harm reduction has been around for a very long time. And we have many Indigenous scholars um, that have come forward in recent years because we started to talk about, not we, but the harm reduction community started to talk about indigenizing harm reduction. And we had some amazing scholars who came forward and said, you don't have to indigenize harm reduction. Harm reduction is one of our principles. And in fact, we've been practicing harm reduction uh, since time memorial. That's how we've survived and taken care of the land and the resources. Um, but we also had to step up our harm reduction game um, when, the, when colonizers showed up here. And so uh, in, in acknowledging the treaties and acknowledging harm reduction, we want to uh, also acknowledge that it's been around for a very, very long time. It just wasn't necessarily called harm reduction. Uh, it's important for me to continue to situate myself because there will be BIPOC people um, on this call. And so my family, one side of my family, my father's side settled from Iceland in um, 1876. They showed up in what was called the Icelandic Reserve, uh, which is just north of Winnipeg here. Uh, on Lake Winnipeg and my family were seamen out in Iceland uh, and came here and had to learn how to be farmers and it was by the gracious um, teachings and kindness of a neighboring Indigenous family on a neighboring homestead that taught my family how to survive here um, because if you look at accounts at the time, my family might not have survived. We were definitely not used to the cold weather and we were definitely not used to um, the water freezing up and not being able to access uh, fish. My other side of the family settled from England. And so this is my mother's father and he settled into Saskatchewan. I'm not sure uh, where in Saskatchewan, my English family uh, are not storytellers like my Icelandic family. Um, but he did uh, eventually settle in Treaty 5 in the PA where he raised his family. And these are a few other people who I need to acknowledge because they are my main teachers in my life. And so there's Joy and Ahab Constant. Joy is my biological mother and that's my stepfather. Um, down on the bottom there, uh, bottom corner is Bruce Martin. That's my biological dad who uh, is Icelandic and raised me in Churchill. Uh, then I'll move over around the circle. There's Leslie Spillett. She is uh, from Snow Lake, uh, but lived in Winnipeg uh, for most of her life now and raised her children here. Uh, she is uh, one of my mothers who we adopted each other in ceremony uh, many years ago. So I want to acknowledge her. And then up in the top corner is my mother-in-law with my uh, auntie. Um, and so Edna Stevens, she's originally from Birch River. And she uh, is also a uh, survivor of residential school um, and is the matriarch, the current matriarch of our family. And then right in the middle there is my ama or my grandmother uh, who had a huge social justice background, um, not intentionally, but ended up just being a social justice person. Uh, and she was the matriarch of our family and she still is one of our uh, leaders and our teachers in our family, even though she passed away. Um, in 97, 1997. So these are some of the people who have been my main teachers when it comes to harm reduction. Um, and so I have to always acknowledge them. And then this is my family. Um, and uh, my partner and I have been together for uh, 26 years now. And we have four beautiful children um, and a lovely child-in-law. And I also want to acknowledge that uh, two of our children identify along the 2S LGBTQ plus spectrum, uh, and which we think we are super, super fortunate for. So uh, this is our little family. Um, I'm also the executive director of the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network. And so I'm going to um, now talk, that's who I am. And that's really important for us as an organization to introduce who we are and how we kind of relate to the space and the time that we hold. Um, but I'm going to now transition to talk about our organization and how we uh, incorporate the uh, you know, participation of people who use drugs 
into the work that we do or into the leadership of our organization. Um, but also, um, uh, we also call that nothing about us without us, right, in some of the literature. So I'm with the Manitoba Harm Reduction Network. Uh, the network and all of our sites are located on Indigenous land. Specifically, we're located on Anishinaabe, Inanu, Anish, Inanu, Dene, and Dakota land. And we're also in the homeland of the Métis Nation. So we have offices throughout the province, which I will show you in a second. Uh, as a non-Indigenous organization, we're committed to the principles of decolonization and reconciliation. Uh, and uh, we are currently working to integrate the TRC calls to action into our work. And we actually developed a toolkit for other non-Indigenous organizations um, to do that as well. And uh, we will be working on incorporating the um, calls to action out of the missing and murdered Indigenous women in Cree into our work as well. And I have to say that this is really important um, for us in our province because uh, in Manitoba, over 20% of the population is Indigenous. We have one of the highest Indigenous populations in the country. Uh, but more importantly, as you move rural and remote, the Indigenous population increases. And so some of our non-Indigenous communities have 50, 60, 70% Indigenous people living in those communities. And so if we go up to our most, one of our most Northern communities, uh, which is a non-Indigenous community, 85% of the population is Indigenous. So we have to really learn how to um, decolonize who we are as an organization uh, when we do our work. Uh, so the organization itself, we are a provincial network uh, and our mission is to coordinate efforts and support harm reduction within and across jurisdictions. And so folks might be quite familiar with jurisdictional issues when it comes to um, supporting um, um, First Nations folks, particularly on reserve or off reserve um, um, folks. And so we are working really hard to um, work across uh, jurisdictions and people will talk about inter jurisdictions. Um, we're just trying to bust through and have like, we're just gonna work wherever people invite us to come um, and support the communities to do their work. I'm not gonna go into the principles of our organization. Uh, lots of them were already mentioned in the previous presentation. But what I'm going to spend some time highlighting is uh, who we are as an organization. And so nothing about us without us is really important in all levels of our infrastructure. Uh, and you will often find things, um, um, people talking about in peer engagement and, and what engaging peers in the work means. And at our, our organization, um, it is integral to how we do our work. So a few things about our council. Uh, our council, according to our bylaws that we just established, uh, must include representation, a representation of the groups that are most impacted by the war on drugs and the war on people who use drugs. And so these are the five categories in our province that we have identified are um, most impacted. And so of course that is peers or people who use drugs, um, people from Northern Manitoba, at least one person from the Indigenous community, someone from the Black community, uh, and someone from the 2S LGBTQ plus community. And so um, our council is made up of 11 people, but at least um, um, minimum of three people have to represent these groups. And you can see uh, where our current status is. Um, and of course, it's six plus because we um, are just doing some demographic stuff um, to determine how many people on our council actually have used substance, have used illegal or illicit substance versus those who continue um, to use uh, illegal or illicit. And please know that um, current use is, is more important than historical use for our membership. Uh, these are some of our team members. And so I'm going to share uh, some of the demographics of our team. Uh, we did a survey last year and we are just embarking on um, re, um, administering that survey. So this data is from when we had 17 team members. We now have 20, so it um, will change slightly. Uh, but this is the demographics of our team. These are some of them. And while you have a peek at it, I want folks to know that we did the demographics because we wanted to actually make sure that our team represented those same groups of people who are most impacted by harms um, and to also give us a good snapshot of who our team was and who was missing from our team, which then uh, informs our uh, human resource strategies, right? So if there's certain folks who are missing, we wanna make sure um, that there's a, 
proper representation. So when we um, have new positions open up, that's who we will be targeting when it comes to hiring folks. So here's some age and ethnicity and children. Here's some gender, um, transgender uh, orientation. I'll just let folks have a quick look at that. And, uh, and as you look at that, you'll be able to start to see who's missing. Like we don't have any um, men on our team. And so that's a group that's missing, for example. This is where people live and work. And when I introduce our um, network itself in a minute, you'll see why this is really important to us. But we have folks who are from all over the province. Um, these are our surveys that I was just saying are in progress. So we have a lived experience survey that we actually um, took about six months to develop and it took a long time to develop for many reasons. Um, but one is that we wanted to look at um, um, some topics that can be quite triggering for folks. So we needed to make sure that our survey was trauma informed uh, and that we um, made sure that people uh, weren't going to be traumatized by taking our survey. Our teammates weren't going to be traumatized, but we also wanted to make sure that the team itself built this survey. So our leadership team didn't build it, the team built the survey. So that survey will give us some data on um, substance use. So our teammates experiences, our teammates and our boards experiences with substances, uh, as well as sex work, and then um, adverse childhood experiences, and then other traumas. So, so that we can look at who our team represents when we're talking about um, substances and peers and peer engagement. And part of this survey came out because uh, our teammate travel, teammates traveled to different conferences and lots of people and a large gamut of people identify as peers, right from like um, quite privileged groups of folks who use drugs all the way to people who are impacted by uh, colonial violence. And that's a really big group to, to blanket under like we're all peers because we use substances. And so we wanted to really look at who um, our team made up and who the peers that we, we uh, work with made, uh, were made up of. Uh, we're doing the same thing. So we have our, our lived experience and our demographic survey that goes to our entire team and our entire council, but we want to make sure that our leadership team and our council uh, are also represented uh, representative of that group, because what we find in harm reduction or in any um, places where they're trying to di diversify their work teams, um, it's often frontline workers who are diversified, but not necessarily at the leadership or the council level. Um, and so we want to make sure that all levels of our organization are representative. So that's our team and who our team is. And what I can tell you is that um, most of our teammates use illegal or illicit substances and have had lots of experience with substances over their time. So one of the um, uh, benefits of our organization is that um, our, or one of the structures of our organization is really to work in rural and remote and northern communities in Manitoba. And we do this because contrary, if you, if you look at like all of the literature, if you listen to people talk, you would think that harm reduction only existed in urban centers. And um, as somebody who grew up in rural Manitoba, I can tell you that harm reduction is alive and well in rural and remote communities, and in fact, has been around for a very, very long time. Um, so I myself was born into um, what was called the ghetto. When I was a kid, it's now called Kelsey Estates. But in that ghetto, I uh, grew up witnessing uh, and participating and watching um, primarily single uh, mothers take care of um, each other in that community. And so I grew up witnessing harm reduction um, and there was no supply distribution, but there was definitely a lot of harm reduction work that was happening. Uh, and I witnessed all of those principles that um, our previous speaker talked about. And so I, like the Dominique was saying, like I witnessed people promoting each other's human rights. I witnessed people opening the door at the middle of the night as uh, you know a mother and her children were um, um, ushered in because of a domestic violence situation and then taking care of that woman and her children and the next day sending her off without judgment knowing that she was returning to that home and so I also saw a lot of substance use and I also uh, saw a lot of violence related to substance use and still saw a community taking care of each other. And so uh, as the executive director of this organization it's really important for me to be clear that 
I don't have a history of substance use. I, I use some alcohol in my younger years and I still um, do use some alcohol, but I had never uh, used an illegal or illicit substance in my life. And uh, my decision-making around that really had to do with uh, my childhood and um, witnessing sexualized violence um, and um, having to having some trauma around that. And so my trauma response is to be in complete control of myself and my body at all times. Uh, and therefore I never actually altered my state of mind um, from illegal or illicit substances. And very few times have I altered my state of mind from alcohol, uh, even though I consume it. And so um, that's my uh, disclosure. And I also recognize that uh, when I was hired for the position, which the Winnipeg peer group participated in selecting me, um, we had a conversation about what it means for me as somebody who doesn't use drugs uh, to run the organization. And um, the consensus and the agreement was that um, people don't listen to people who use drugs at this time in Manitoba or at that time. Um, and so my work is to get people to start listening to people who use drugs. And then um, my days are numbered and I'll move out of this seat. And the hope is that, um, you know, someone from the BIPOC community who's maybe trans, uh, who uses drugs and uses drugs regularly and has some harms related to their substance use, runs this organization. So that's our actual succession plan for me, or for the organization, but to kick me out of this seat. So how do we do our work? We have 12 or 11 peer advisory councils in the province. And uh, as you can see by our map, they are all over the province and they are made up of um, anywhere from 12 to 20 people who use drugs locally um, who come together to do their work. And so who is a peer in our definition of a peer, it is somebody who is a member of the affected community. Um, so could be impacted by HIV or hepatitis C. Uh, and uses substances and uh, is working in their community to keep each other safe. Uh, but it also has to intersect with the social determinants of health. So we're talking about folks who are impacted by colonial and structural violence, like poverty um, or um, um, racism, like all of those social ageism, sexism, all of those kinds of things. So we're often talking about people who are also impacted by houselessness. The peer groups, I'm gonna highlight a couple things they do, but all of the peer groups meet monthly. They do their own capacity bridging. So for example, we're in an overdose crisis. So all of our peer groups are like, I need to know how to perform CPR and first aid and to administer naloxone and to teach my friends how to administer naloxone. So that's some of the work that they do. They also do their own peer-to-peer -peer events that we support um, them to do. And um, they also do some research. So I'm gonna just highlight a couple things. I think I'm running out of time here soon, but I'll highlight a few things that the peer groups have done. Uh, so this is the peers honoring some other peers uh, are their own peers in the work that they've done. So there was um, an award ceremony where we honored a lifetime harm reductionist. Um, in the middle there, Ken Bristow, which some folks on this Line might actually know him. Uh, and then we also honored uh, annually a harm reductionist that the peers themselves chose to honor out of their group. Uh, this is a manifest, the manifestos we did. So we support our peer groups, but we also, not our group, sorry, that's patronizing. We support the peer groups, but we also support peer-based organizations. So we support MANDU, we support the Two-Spirit People of Manitoba, uh, as well as the Manitou Ikwe Kegwe uh, Women's Advisory Council at the time. And this is a project we did with them to develop their um, personal manifestos. Uh, there's a couple more that are on here uh, that you can check out actually on our website as well. Um, this is just some more of the work that the peers have done. Uh, this is another great tool that the peers did. It's an alternative to calling the police. And in our province, we had a problem uh, with folks confusing um, being uncomfortable with unsafe and calling the police on people. Uh, and so the peer working group in Winnipeg wanted to, to talk to people about like, when are you unsafe versus when are you uncomfortable? Uh, and um, did this beautiful flow chart on if and when you ever call the police, which you should not, but anyway, you can check that out on our website. This is a photo of a peer-to-peer -peer event. So uh, the one of our peer groups in Swan River uh, hosted a, an event um, 
you know, right from the group, like did all the planning for it, um, hosted a health fair for other people who use drugs in the community. And so um, the piece I want to highlight is the, the photo down in the right corner um, is a closet room in the building we were in. They literally emptied out the closet and brought in a hospital bed so that they could do pap tests right there so that people who, um, you, as we all know, people who use drugs don't access um, healthcare services very often, if ever, because of stigma and discrimination. And so we basically brought a hospital out to them in the space that they identified and we brought the resources that they identified they wanted there. Um, and so um, to add to that being adaptive and innovative, um, we were able to offer pap tests to people who had, some of them stated they had never had a pap test and um, others said they hadn't had pap tests since they were pregnant, which was 25 years ago. So this is a great example of peer leadership. When peers are in charge, then great things get done. Um, for time, I'm going to jump ahead. This is one of our Thunder Bear Walker groups up in Flint Flon, um, and you can check out their um, HIV research project on our website. This is some of the beautiful posters that came out of that project. Uh, and then the other complement of nothing about us without us, of course, is our local harm reduction networks. So everywhere we have a peer advisory council, we have a uh, harm reduction network and that network um, is uh, follows those principles nothing about us without us we know that every all of the answers to any challenges in the community actually reside in the community so we wanted to create some infrastructure for those um, service providers community leaders to come together um, to act to also address the harms in their community primarily th those systemic harms for people who use substances um, and so just to reiterate who's on that, uh, on the networks, they're, they're made up of our regional health authority representatives, uh, community-based organizations that work with people who use drugs, our tribal councils um, sit on them, and our non-affiliated uh, community reps. So some of our communities are not affiliated with tribal councils, our First Nations communities, our Indigenous communities. Uh, and then our peer council members also sit on that network um, to advise the network as well. And here's some of the things they do, very similar to um, the peer working group. They also meet regularly and they do their own capacity building. And then they also host uh, education and outreach or awareness events out in the community, um, which is a ton of fun. Uh, and then I'm gonna highlight this quick project. Uh, this, our, our Thompson um, Safer Choices Northern Network, partnered with their peer, a uh, youth peer group uh, and developed uh, some sexual health camp, a sexual health campaign based on the seven teachings. You can check out these beautiful um, posters on our website as well. We just partnered with the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority to relaunch them um, here in the city. Uh, but some folks may be familiar with them. The campaign initially talked about barriers and now it talks about things like pleasure, consent, a bunch of other um, things around sexual health as well. But this is the magic when the community does its work and is given the resources to do what they know is best for their community, then beautiful things happen. This is um, Lockers. We have uh, a community, Flimplon, which is in Northern Manitoba, but halfway up the province. Um, the peer working group or the peer advisory council there worked with the RHA and developed an alternate supply distribution program where they have lockers outside the building that they can access at any time. Uh, and they chose lockers over vending machines because it gets to minus 40 in Flint Flon and they didn't know if a vending machine would hold up to that. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna jump ahead to a few things. This is um, a tool that was done by some of our teammates who uh, use, who go to festivals, both here in Manitoba and other places and use substances at festivals. Um, and so they did a survey and looked at uh, what harm reduction services were needed in Manitoba at our festivals. It's an amazing tool. Um, you can check it out and it might be helpful in your area too if you have festivals that people use lots of drugs and alcohol and there's not a lot of harm reduction services at them. So while I'm having these um, images up, the last thing I'm gonna share with you uh, uh, when we look at our principle of nothing about us without us is um, how we developed our national substance use awareness 
um, campaign this week or this year. These are previous um, campaign images, and you can see these all on our website as well. Uh, and our campaign was always designed, we've been doing it now for four years, and it was always designed to stop talking about substance use that week as all addiction, and also designed to stop talking about it from an individual perspective and more from a systems analysis. And um, so for this year's campaign, last year we had a gathering and we had a gathering um, of folks who are parents or pregnant um, who come together, or who came together for one day um, to talk about a lot of the discourses around pregnancy um, and parenting while using substances. And as we are, as we're all very familiar with, um, people who are pregnant or parenting and use substances have a huge threat and in fact a reality of children being stolen from them um, solely because they use substances. And so we gathered together um, in ceremony for a full day and we asked um, folks, which in this group of photos, at least 50% of the people in the photo uh, or in attendance, sorry, were people who um, are impacted by the topic uh, or work with families who are impacted by that. Sorry, 50% were impacted and the rest of the folks were either impacted or uh, work with families. And we asked them, one of the things we asked them was, what do we need to tell people about um, people who are pregnant and parenting? And we built this year's campaign. And so some of our images were out last week um, for National Substance Use Awareness Week. And these are some of um, the things they wanted us to tell people. And um, uh, what I can tell you this week is that people who use drugs and have the right to parent, as well as the wine mums um, are no different than mums who use crack, um, were our two biggest hits and um, created a lot of dialogue for us. Um, uh, and the whole point to the campaign, of course, is to jar the current discourse and to put a different narrative out there and get people thinking differently. And our last image, of course, was this beautiful one. And I'm going to end it at that. And I apologize if I took up too much time. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. So much interesting work. Let's take a pause for a second as Sophie switches gears. We're going to welcome Chantel. Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Oui, on t'entend. Parfait. Je vais mon téléphone sonne pour vous. Alors, euh, je, je peux commencer maintenant? Oui, vas-y. D'accord. Euh, Rebonjour. Alors, euh, mon nom est Chantal Perron. Euh, je suis euh, chargée de projet à l'organisme Métadam, comme j'ai dit euh, tout à l'heure. Euh, donc, je suis une part qui a déjà consommé des drogues pendant 10 ans et euh, ça fait maintenant plus de 25 ans que je ne consomme plus. Euh, je suis sur un programme de Métadone euh, à ce jour. Euh, à Métadone, c'est un organisme par et pour les personnes qui consomment ou qui ont déjà consommé des opioïdes. Donc, c'est notre définition de par et pour. Euh, je suis aussi une militante. Euh, qui défend les drogues depuis de, les, les personnes qui consomment les drogues depuis de nombreuses années afin d'améliorer euh, leurs leur conditions. Et euh, j'ai euh, défendu aussi les droits des personnes euh, qui vivent avec le VIH, euh, dont je fais partie aussi. Aujourd'hui, je vais parler de Profane, qui est un projet euh, euh, dont j'ai écrit euh, euh, l'origine au début, euh, avec l'aide évidemment de mon équipe et du docteur euh, Marie-Ève Goyé, qui est une qui travaillait à cette époque et qui travaillait encore euh, au CRAN. Donc, le CRAN, c'est le euh, Centre d'aide euh, aux narcomanes, de recherche et d'aide aux narcomanes. Euh, euh, Profane est un, était euh, un projet de méta, Métadam et du CRAN et aussi avait comme partenaire euh, l'Institut Douglas euh, et l'équipe de chercheurs de Michel Perrault. Donc, Profane, ça veut dire, comme vous voyez, prévenir et réduire les overdoses et faciliter l'accès au naloxone. Euh, C'est une formation qui est donnée par des usagers et qui vise essentiellement à rejoindre les personnes les plus à risque, les usagers et les pères, et ensuite les personnes autour d'elles, et ensuite euh, 
les organismes communautaires et ensuite les premiers répondants. Et ensuite, et ça allait en cirque concentrique. Euh, ça, c'était vraiment notre désir au début. Vous allez voir un petit peu plus loin comment ça a été. Alors, euh, quel est le contexte du début? Alors, euh, le contexte du début, c'était que euh, on était en contact avec d'autres associations. Mais Saddam est en contact avec d'autres associations au Canada d'usagers de drogue. Et euh, en, euh, en particulier ceux de Vancouver. Et il nous disait euh, il y avait une crise de redose là-bas et que c'était certain que c'était pour arriver à Montréal. Nous, on n'avait pas encore ça euh, en 2014. Euh, donc, on s'est dit, il faut faire quelque chose tout de suite. Il faut euh, s'assurer que les usagers de drogue euh, aient du naloxone avec eux parce que c'est trop long à attendre pour l'ambulance. À ce moment-là, au Québec, personne n'avait accès à la naloxone. Donc, on s'est dit, OK, on va créer un projet, même si on n'a pas accès à la naloxone. Euh, le projet a été refusé, malheureusement. Et euh, l'année d'après, en, en 2015, il y a eu une vague de redose au printemps. Et c'est là que euh, notre projet a été accepté. Euh, la santé publique nous a appelé et euh, nous a dit, OK, on, on va faire un comité avec vous. On va être tous partenaires. Donc, la santé publique, euh, Métadam, le CRAN et euh, l'Institut de glace et santé mentale avec l'équipe euh, de Michel Perrault pour faire ce projet-là profane. Et euh, donc, euh, on a été subventionné par euh, le ministère de la Santé. Donc, euh, si euh, on parle de, du naloxone à ce moment-là, donc je vous ai dit que le naloxone n'était pas euh, couvert. Personne n'en avait. Les seuls qui avaient accès euh, au naloxone, c'était les professionnels qui travaillaient dans les urgences et puis quelques équipes d'ambulanciers. Euh, il y avait environ quatre véhicules au Québec qui avaient de naloxone. Donc, on partait de loin. Euh, L'autre difficulté, c'était que quand on utilise le naloxone, la personne qui fait l'overdose, euh, donc euh, absolument, c'est-à-dire que quand on prescrit un médicament, le médecin prescrit un médicament, il devrait le prescrire à la personne qui fait l'overdose, mais dans ce cas-ci, elle ne peut pas se l'administrer elle-même, c'est un tiers qui va administrer. Donc, c'était une autre complication qu'on avait à faire face. Euh, ce qu'on a fait à ce moment-là, c'est qu'il euh, y a un médecin de la santé publique qui a, qui a fait une prescription communautaire, donc qui a prescrit l'analoxone au projet entier de profane. Comme ça, toutes les personnes qui faisait la formation profane pour avoir accès à une trousse de naloxone. C'est le seul moyen, à ce moment-là, d'avoir de naloxone au Québec. Et puis, euh, c'est comme ça qu'on a commencé. L'autre défi qu'on avait, c'était que la naloxone, ça fonctionne pour les opéides. Euh, à Montréal, où est-ce que le projet a commencé, essentiellement, la majorité des, des, des drogues dures consommées étaient la cocaïne. Euh, donc, on n'a pas de naloxone. Donc, euh, j'ai vraiment euh, combattu fort pour que... On a des, des notions de base pour savoir quoi faire en cas de situation euh, d'overdose de coke dans notre formation euh, et donc euh, qu'on inclut le RCA pour pouvoir faire face à cette situation-là. Donc, euh, c'est quoi euh, Profan? Euh, donc, plus concrètement, euh, c'est une formation d'une journée donnée par des pairs. Euh, on avait sélectionné six pairs au début et il y avait un grand défi. Il fallait que ce soit des pairs qui aient des habiletés de pouvoir transmettre une information vraiment précise, qui sont capables d'animer euh, des salles, de parler en public. Donc, euh, on, on les a formés. Et ce qu'on a fait au début, c'est qu'on les a jumelés par deux. Donc, il y avait toujours deux pairs qui faisaient la formation profane euh, aux participants. Moi, j'étais toujours là. Et puis, il y avait aussi une infirmière du cran qui était là. Comme ça, s'il y avait des questions euh, auxquelles je ne pouvais pas répondre, bien, l'infirmière ou moi, on pouvait les, les seconder. Donc, c'est comme ça qu'on a fait, euh, on a bâti l'atelier. L'atelier durait trois heures. Donc, on faisait profane le matin et l'après-midi, on faisait la section RCA qui était faite par un instructeur externe de la ferme euh, Langevin euh, qui venait vraiment enseigner le RCA à nos participants. Le public cible, j'en ai parlé tantôt, nous, on voulait aller en cercle concentré pour euh, euh, cibler le plus de monde possible, mais au début, on nous a demandé de vraiment se concentrer sur euh, les personnes les plus à risque, donc les usagers de drogue, les pères, leurs proches. Euh, et la, la famille, les amis les plus proches. Donc, j'ai déjà parlé, c'était un partenariat euh, communautaire, un partenariat euh, du communautaire avec la région de la santé et la santé publique, le ministère de la santé, euh, la santé et les chercheurs. Euh, les chercheurs étaient là surtout pour le volet euh, évaluation et monitorage, dans le but de démontrer que l'alloxone, ça peut sauver des vies, euh, de montrer que l'implication des pairs, c'est vraiment pertinent et surtout pour donner beaucoup de crédibilité à notre euh, formation. Euh, si je vois l'autre euh, slide, ici on voit des participants, euh, des pairs qui sont en train de donner euh, une, une formation. 
On peut aller à la suivante. Donc, euh, les défis euh, euh, qu'on avait, c'est de rejoindre les personnes les plus vulnérables. Souvent, il y a des gens qui disent, trois heures ne vont jamais rester là tout le temps. Mais en, dans les faits, après trois ans, j'ai seulement deux participants qui ont quitté la salle parce qu'ils n'étaient pas capables de rester longtemps. Mais ils sont, il y en a un là-dessus qui est revenu. Donc, euh, tous nos participants, euh, de la, pendant les trois premières années, sont restés euh, tout le long de la formation. Euh, avoir l'accès à l'analoxone, nous, on voulait vraiment qu'à la fin de la formation, et surtout qu'on puisse leur remettre l'analoxone, ça n'a pas pu être possible. Ce qu'on a pu faire, c'est avoir des pharmacies proches et quand les gens, les participants sortaient, ils allaient chercher l'analoxone. Et le dernier défi qu'on avait, c'était euh, l'appel au 9 heures. Ça, c'est un défi qui, euh, euh, dont toutes les, les, les formations dans le monde qui sont, qui sont faites pour l'analoxone, euh, c'est un gros défi de que les gens, quand il y a une overdose, appel au 9 heures, les gens, pour plusieurs raisons, ne veulent pas appeler. Donc, nous, c'était la même chose. C'était quelque chose qu'on a travaillé fort pour permettre les gens. Donc, par exemple, on a fait des contacts avec les premiers répondants pour les sensibiliser à la situation pour que quand ils arrivent sur les lieux, euh, ils soient là pour la santé publique et non pas pour arrêter les gens. Si on regarde à la prochaine, on va passer celle-là parce que je n'aurai pas assez de temps. Euh, donc, les impacts et bénéfices qu'on a eus, c'est que plus d'un tiers des personnes qui, qui ont fait la formation euh, autant les performateurs que les participants qui recevaient ont changé leurs habitudes de consommation et ça, ce n'est pas quelque chose qu'on avait prévu. On était vraiment euh, surpris et heureux de ça. Donc, non seulement ils étaient capables de faire face à un overdose, mais eux-mêmes avaient changé leur comportement. La plupart des gens se sont dit qu'ils étaient moins stressés, plus confiants. Ils sentaient aussi qu'ils étaient vraiment une part de la société, maintenant que tu es vraiment des citoyens responsables. Euh, et tous, ou à peu près, ont dit qu'il était vraiment utile d'avoir un cours de ACR. La suivante. Donc, après avoir fait trois ans de profane, on a pu compter euh, de 2015, 16 et 17, euh, 1400 personnes qu'on qu a formées, 1000 trousses qu'on avait distribuées et plus de 90 trousses dont on sait qu'elles ont été utilisées, c'est-à-dire au moins 90 vies sauvées. Donc, euh, euh, à la, au début de 2017, en novembre 2017, nous, on a fini, on n'avait plus de subventions. Quelques semaines après, on a appris que l'analoxone serait maintenant gratuite, remboursée par le gouvernement. Donc, actuellement, toute personne citoyenne du Québec peut aller à la pharmacie et avoir une trousse d'analoxone gratuitement. Qu'est-ce qui est de la suite? Euh, L'effet profane, j'en ai parlé, c'est l'augmenter l'estime de soi, la confiance en soi. Et surtout, euh, euh, ça a inspiré beaucoup de gens à à faire plus dans la vie. Euh, beaucoup des participants nous ont dit que c'est la première fois qu'ils finissaient quelque chose. Donc, il y avait du début à la fin et qu'ils finissaient. Ça, c'est un grand accomplissement pour eux. En conclusion, euh, en conclusion, je peux vous dire qu'à la fin des trois ans, euh, nous, euh, notre défi, c'était vraiment, on voulait euh, que le projet continue à l'extérieur de Montréal. On voulait surtout que le projet continue à vivre tout simplement. À chaque année, ça avait été vraiment euh, une course euh, au financement. Et euh, on voulait que le médicament, euh, euh, l'analoxone, soit sur la RAMQ. Comme j'ai dit, à la fin du projet, ça ne l'était pas, mais trois semaines après, ça l'a été. Alors, euh, moi, je vais vous euh, laisser la deuxième partie parce qu'après ces trois années-là, on est passé à un autre profane, le profane 2.0. Et puis, moi, en tant que coordonnatrice, j'ai passé la barre à Guillaume Tremblay, qui est le coordonnateur maintenant de profane 2.0 et qui va vous raconter la suite. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Chantal. Là, j'essaie de trouver Start My Video. Je l'ai trouvé Start My Video. Yes, yes. Bonjour. Donc, euh... Oui, donc, euh, c'est ça. Donc, moi, je suis arrivé dans Profane comment? En fait, je suis arrivé dans Profane en 2018, en fait, en août 2018. Pourquoi? Parce que, bon, Métadame euh, avait reçu un mandat dans le cadre d'une stratégie. Euh, en fait, là, le gouvernement du Québec euh, avait lancé en grande pompe en plein mois de juillet 2018 une stratégie pour faire face à la crise et surdose d'opioïdes apparente là, qui, qui allait arriver au Québec parce que, bon... On n'est pas dans le même contexte que Vancouver. Il faut bien comprendre que la, les, euh, le, 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 le contexte des surdoses opioïdes, c'est vraiment qu'il y a une crise localisée. Donc, euh, au Québec, elle est différente, là, elle d'un autre couleur, une autre forme. Euh, et euh, donc, en juillet 2018, il y a eu une stratégie qui a été mise en place par le gouvernement pour faire face à ça. Et euh, Métadame a été euh, mandaté dans le cadre de cette stratégie-là pour euh, mettre en place 
une formation euh, euh, à l'intention, en fait, de, de, de développer Profane, mais pour l'ensemble de la province du Québec, mais aussi en collaboration avec l'Association des intervenants indépendants du Québec pour former euh, l'ensemble du milieu communautaire. Donc, quand on parle de milieu communautaire, là, on parle d'intervenants, on parle de personnes euh, en soutien administratif, on parle de toutes les gens qui œuvrent ou qui s'impliquent dans ces milieux-là. Donc, voilà. Donc, euh, donc, là, je viens de vous dire un petit peu rapidement le contexte de création. Donc, moi, je suis arrivé pour, euh, dans un contexte, dans ce contexte-là, euh, j'avais, un, ben, comme je vous ai dit en d'entrée de jeu, j'ai consommé plus de 25 ans là, une panoplie de substances. Euh, j'ai dû con, euh, aussi euh, vivre avec euh, des troubles concomitants. Euh, donc, euh, j'ai fait de la prison, j'ai fait de la psychiatrie. En tout cas, j'ai tout pas mal vu qu -ce qui, comment ça se ramait les bains. <rire> les services. Et donc, j'ai euh, suis arrivé avec quand même, moi, une, une grande... Tu sais, tout à l'heure, il y avait quelqu'un qui posait une question là, dans les questions euh, euh, par rapport à la, la, la présentation de, de Dominique, à savoir, elle disait, bien là, là, la réduction des méfaits, c'est toujours un concept où ça devrait être une philosophie. En tout cas, nous, à Métadame, c'en est une philosophie. Ça, tra ça transparaît dans tout qu ce qu'on fait. Donc, à chaque fois qu'on avance, on doit, à chaque fois qu'on avance quelque part ou qu'on qu s'engage dans quelque chose, il faut qu'il y, un, 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 qu y ait les principes de la réduction des méfaits qui sont présents. Puis on est constamment euh, poussé par différentes factions, là, je ne sais pas comment nommer ça, là, par, à cause de différents phénomènes, par différents groupes d'intérêts, à, 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 à adopter d'autres voies. Puis c'est très difficile pour nous de ramener sur les rails de la réduction des méfaits, le profane 2.0, surtout dans un contexte provincial où là, vraiment, on est dans, dans un autre niveau territorial là, pour organiser avec un ensemble de partenaires. Mais bon, la force de profane aussi, c'est de travailler conjointement avec beaucoup de partenaires. Là. Maintenant, on, beaucoup, on travaille avec beaucoup de partenaires au niveau euh, provincial, mais même au niveau national. Là. Donc, on est sur des comités, des instances euh, au niveau national. Donc, euh, c'est un, un programme qui devient de plus en plus complexe je vous dirais, de par cette particularité-là, là, parce qu'on n'est pas juste en train de montrer comment utiliser l'analoxane dans Profane. En fait, quest ce qu'on veut faire, c'est vraiment de, oui, transmettre des connaissances, mais on veut aller au-delà de ça. Là. On veut que les gens puissent partager leur expérience. Donc, c'est ça l'idée. Donc, euh, c'est une migration. Il y a eu une migration du programme de, de, par rapport à celui que, que Chantal vous a expliqué tout à l'heure. Donc, euh, nous, là, les, les pères, c'est l'ADN de Profane. Donc, ils doivent être au cœur de tout qu ce qu'on fait. Donc, les, les pères, les personnes avec, là, quand je dis les pères, c'est des personnes qui utilisent des substances ou des personnes avec un, une expérience, tu sais, comme moi, qui est un père qui n'utilise plus de substances, mais euh, qui, euh, qui en a utilisé longtemps, donc avec une expérience vécue. Donc, l'animation des formations, c'est avec, euh, avec des pères. La coordination du programme, c'est avec les, les, les pères. L'implantation aussi. Tous les aspects de la recherche, on est au cœur de tout ça, puis tous les aspects de développement. Bref, c'est un programme, c est, c est, en anglais, on parle d'un peer lead, c'est vraiment ça l'idée. C'est vraiment un programme euh, de, avec un leadership très fort par les pairs. Donc, euh, euh, puis l'objectif principal du programme, ça aussi, c'est quelque chose, j'en parlais dès ce matin avec mon, mon, mon conseiller, avec mon collègue, là, mon conseiller en développement, on se disait que... Pourquoi qu'on est tout le temps euh, poussé à, 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 à bifurquer notre trajectoire? Notre objectif premier, nous autres, c'est sauver des vies. Là, on veut qu'on ait, tu sais, des talk we die, là, nous autres, on l'applique, on est dans l'action. On veut qu'on veut que ça, ça cesse. Ça. Donc, on veut faire en sorte que les gens puissent habiliter à sauver des vies. Puis si ça, ça prend euh, de, 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 de devoir échanger de l'information sensible, bien, on va le faire. Là. Fait que nous autres, on pousse un petit peu des gens dans des branches dans nos formations pour que justement là, on puisse échanger de l'information puis qu'on parle en toute transparence. Donc, c'est ça l'idée. Donc, on a euh, rapidement, on a une formation à l'intention du milieu communautaire qui, euh, comme je le disais, là, notre public cible, c'est l'ensemble des personnes qui œuvrent dans ces milieux-là. Donc, notre action, c'est vraiment de de, de, de pouvoir habiloter, un, en fait, d'outiller de, 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 un organisme communautaire à pouvoir faire face aux surdoses opioïdes dans leur organisme en tant que tel. Donc, ça, c'est la. Donc, on a développé cette formation-là conjointement avec euh, l'Association des 
êtes intervenant en dépendance du Québec, mais on a aussi bonifié notre formation à l'intention des usagers et de leurs proches. Quand on parle d'usagers, on parle d'usagers du milieu communautaire. Non, mais on a voulu élargir. Oui, on parle des personnes qui, euh, qui, euh, sont, euh, qui, qui, qui utilisent des substances, mais on va au-delà de ça. Là. On veut vraiment que ce soit l'ensemble du milieu communautaire qui puisse se mobiliser pour faire face aux surdoses. Donc, donc, ça prend l'ensemble des usagers du milieu communautaire, donc euh, qui utilisent des drogues ou pas. En fait, euh, on ne fait pas de distinction et euh, euh, qui, qui peut sauver qui, là, puis euh, pourquoi euh, une personne est plus à risque de surdose ou pas. On veut justement le plus possible outiller l'ensemble des personnes qui peuvent être en contact avec des personnes à risque de surdose. Donc, euh, l'implantation du, du, du programme, on a fait, on a dû développer puis consolider une nouvelle mouture. Donc, une, on a mis en place une structure d'évaluation d'évaluation et organisationnelle euh, très, très rigoureuse, justement, pour pouvoir démontrer auprès de nos bailleurs de fonds que notre approche euh, de, à, par, par la base, là, par les pairs, fonctionne bien. Puis c'est quand même une réussite d'avoir aussi un groupe de recherche qui vient évaluer l'impact que, que le programme a au niveau de l'acquisition des connaissances, mais aussi euh, par rapport au, à l'aisance des gens à intervenir en situation de surdose, nous aide beaucoup. Euh, on a dû développer une formation en milieu communautaire, je l'ai déjà dit. On a, dans notre formation usagers proches, euh, Chantal vous a dit qu'on faisait appel à des paramédics pour donner leur volet ARC. Maintenant, on a développé notre propre volet RCR. Donc, c'est des pairs formateurs. En fait, c'est des personnes. Là, on n'est même plus rendu qu'on dit des pairs formateurs puis des formateurs intervenants. On a des formateurs profanes. Peu importe que tu viennes, que, que tu partages une expérience d'intervention, une expérience vécue, on est tous sur le même pied d'égalité. Donc, le volet RCR est donné par l'ensemble de nos formateurs profanes. On a aussi fait une adaptation des milieux spécifiques. Donc, euh, là, un, un des milieux, c'est les anglophones. Au Québec, on a des anglophones. Donc, euh, on a dû adapter notre formation pour, comme je le disais tantôt, on a une approche populationnelle. Donc, on veut le plus possible euh, pouvoir... Euh, outiller l'ensemble des milieux. Donc, on a traduit l'ensemble de nos outils didactiques. On a aussi adapté notre, euh, notre formation euh, au milieu autochtone. Euh, et euh, pour ce faire, on a travaillé conjointement avec eux. Donc, on a travaillé à comprendre la réalité. Euh, on on, on s'est attelé à pouvoir adapter aux réalités culturelles la, la formation. Donc, on a fait aussi une panoplie de... On est dans ça encore, là, de la création d'outils didactiques et promotionnels, puis l'élaboration d'une offre de service euh, en deux temps. On a fait une première phase de déploiement euh, dans 2019-2020, et là, actuellement... Là, je vous parle de, de, comme je vous disais, de Sherbrooke tout à l'heure. On est en train, il y a une formation qui est en train de se donner à Sherbrooke aujourd'hui, formation pour le milieu communautaire. Donc, on donne, là, on est reparti sur la route. On a dû travailler d'arrache-pied dans le contexte COVID pour pouvoir le faire, mais on a eu la vague à la santé, services sociaux pour ce faire. Donc, la première sous sanitaire, là, pour faire court, il y a, il y a euh, là, ma connexion, elle me dit que je suis instable. Voilà, c'est un peu dans le champ, je vous dirais. <rire> Aujourd'hui, c'est dans un champ. Donc, euh, voilà. Euh, c'est ça, profane. C'est ça, profane, une partout. Donc, euh, 18 régions socio-sanitaires au Québec. Euh, on en a visité 14 sur 18 dans notre première phase de déploiement. On a donné 59 formations pour le milieu communautaire et 19 formations pour les usagers et les proches. Euh, là, depuis le, 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 le début de la deuxième phase de formation, de déploiement plutôt, on a donné 18 formations, euh, dont euh, notre première formation usagers proches adaptée autochtone en anglais, parce que là, on est rendu avec huit versions de formation différentes. Et donc, cette formation-là adaptée, euh, Temiskaming First Nation, en tout cas, ça a répondu là, présent, là, ça, on a... On a on a pété des records, on, on refusait du monde à la porte, juste pour vous dire, fait que c'était quand même un très beau succès. C'est vraiment le fun de voir ça quand que les communautés sont, sont, sont très mobilisées et sont tissées serrées. C'est vraiment beau à voir. C'est comme notre cadeau là, là, quand, on, quand on voit ça. Euh, Quelques résultats d'évaluation. Ben, la question de connaissance, euh, on a un impact direct là, euh, sur, euh, sur les personnes. Là. Donc, on a vu vraiment que les, euh, les répondants se sentent… En fait, notre objectif 
principal, c'est que les gens puissent agir ou prévenir les surdoses. Donc, si là, les gens, après notre formation, se disent, de, disent oui, moi, là, après avoir suivi Profane, moi, je, je me sens confiant pour pouvoir intervenir en, faire, euh, face à une surdose d'opioïdes, bien, on va avoir réussi un, un, un de nos mandats, un de nos objectifs. Notre deuxième objectif, c'est de pouvoir aussi réussir à, 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 à échanger de l'information. Donc, nos, nos, nos formations profanes sont vraiment montées à ce qu'il y ait un échange d'expérience, pas juste des formateurs, mais aussi des gens qui participent à la formation. Donc, euh, c'est vraiment ça l'idée, puis c'était pour ça qu'on a défendu bec et ongle le retour de profanes en présence malgré la COVID, parce que tout le monde nous disait « faites ça en Zoom, faites ça en Zoom ». On dit « non, en Zoom, on n'est pas dans les communautés. Non, en Zoom, on ne voit pas le monde. Non, en Zoom, le monde, ce n'est pas vrai que le monde, ils vont, ils vont partager autant qu'en euh, présentiel. » Donc, c'est pour ça qu'on a reparti. Entre autres, là, je vous fais ça court. La, les suites du programme, bien, développement d'outils didactiques et d'intervention, on est en train de euh, en ce moment, là, en, ce soir, il faut, faut que je regarde une vidéo qu'on qu est en train de, de, de développer. Euh, des aides-mémoires qu'on a, qu a développées, une boîte à outils qui est en construction, une foire aux questions, une interface de communication. Pourquoi tout ça? Pour, parce que dans notre, on on, dès, dès 2018, on s'était dit, pour qu'il y ait une pérennité du programme, il va falloir que les régionalement, euh, profanes puissent être donnés et s'adapter aux réalités locales. Et donc, pour ce faire, on a, dès 2018, on, on avait pensé à créer une formation de formateur. Et là, ça va au-delà de ça, parce que là, on travaille à, à ce développement-là. Ça va au-delà d'une formation de formateur. C'est vraiment un réseau communautaire en prévention et prise en charge des surdoses qui est en train de s'organiser. Et ce, au niveau régional, régionalement, il y a des groupes qui font ça. Et nous, au niveau provincial, on est en train de, de mettre, de mettre ces, ces, ces groupes-là de travail ensemble. Donc, c'est un peu ça les, 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 nouvelles, les nouvelles étapes. Et là, comme je vous l'ai dit, on est en deuxième phase de déploiement. Depuis novembre dernier, là, on a recommencé notre, nos formations en présentiel un peu partout au Québec. Donc, euh, on voulait, avoir, on voulait pouvoir faire des adaptations des formations des milieux spécifiques et pour certaines populations. Puis pour ce faire, bien, ça va être vraiment euh, la formation de formateur qui va pouvoir nous l'offrir. Mais on a déjà des idées. Là. Avec la formation de formateur, on veut créer des trucs en web diffusion. On veut pouvoir aussi euh, créer des formations sur mesure, comme par exemple en intervention en milieu festif, ajuster nos modalités d'organisation des formations, des horaires plus souples dans certaines régions. À, à Chicoutimi, par exemple, vous avez dit pourquoi vous ne faites pas ça le soir. Euh, on pourrait -tu avoir des formations plus courtes, euh, des formations plus longues. Euh, bref, c'est un peu ça qui est en train de se tramer. Là. On travaille à adapter euh, l'ensemble de nos outils pour qu'ils soient adaptables. Parce que c'est ça, là, on l'a vu tantôt, là, Dominique nous l'a montré dans les attributs d'arrêt en effet, de s'adapter puis qu'on innove, fait qu on est là-dedans. Là. Ça demande quand même, c'est un petit peu plus long d'implanter des choses quand on fait ça, parce que nous aussi, notre, 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 euh, notre objectif, c'était vraiment de mobiliser les bases, donc de se coller aux réalités des des euh, les besoins et réalités du terrain. Là. Donc, il faut y aller sur le terrain. Ce n'est pas en étant de Montréal que je vais savoir Qu'est-ce qui se passe, exemple, à Témiscamingue First Nation? Il a fallu que je les rencontre, ces gens-là. Là, je connais, je comprends un peu plus leur réalité maintenant. Euh, donc, un, vraiment un réseau de formateurs nationaux assurant l'autonomie dans chaque région sanitaire. Plusieurs types de formations possibles pour différents contextes. Puis, un incubateur pour l'implantation d'un réseau, euh, réseau communautaire en prise en charge et euh, prévention des surdoses. Euh, on veut... En fait, on veut partager notre expertise dans la présentation des surdoses dans d'autres dans tribunes, ce qu'on fait déjà. On est sur plusieurs instances, comme je vous disais, des groupes de travail, soit en prévention des surdoses ou euh, dans d'autres types d'initiatives du, du, du genre. Là, tu sais, quand on pense à Safe Supply ou euh, Drug Checking, c'est la même chose. Tu sais, c'est toute la prévention des surdoses pour nous. Donc, on s'implique là-dedans. Euh, on, on veut partager nos outils aussi euh, au plus grand nombre. Donc, on va, on va pouvoir le faire là, dès qu'on va mettre en ligne là, notre boîte d'outils et notre foire aux questions 
en deux langues officielles. Là. Donc, nous, tout notre programme est bilingue du début à la fin. Puis, euh, peut-être de futur profane ailleurs, qui sait, on était en pourparler avec l'Ontario avant la COVID, pré-COVID, et en France aussi, on avait été approché par la France pour pouvoir implanter ça dans certaines régions de France. Donc, euh, ben, on va voir qu'est-ce que l'avenir nous réserve dans ce sens-là. On va commencer. Déjà au Québec, on en a beaucoup là, à faire, donc euh, je dirais qu'on ne manque pas de job. Là. Donc, euh, voilà. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Guillaume et Chantal. Some amazing work that's happening out there. Um, I'd like to invite some people to ask some questions for our uh, presenters. So I know that uh, uh, this is like the, because we, we, we kind of went over time a little bit. We had the interpretation, we had a couple of things and things like that. So usually we have a lot more time for questions and answers. One of the things that I thought that was interesting is Dominique in your, in your ending of your PowerPoint, you said, what does the future of harm reduction look like? Or what are the things that we need to, you know, all, the, all of what you guys just talked about during all, all of your presentations. What, what, what does the future hold? What do you guys, how do you see it? And maybe we can go around because we won't have that much time to answer a lot. I think Dominique and Jessica did answer some of the questions in, in the things. And um, I think that could be a nice little conclusion or something like that. And also I'll put in the chat the evaluation Uh, of the presentation today, but it will be sent also afterwards. So I would let somebody start on that. Uh, what, what does the future hold or how do you guys see it or what are the things that we should be seeing uh, more of in, in, in uh, harm reduction? I can start if you like. Go for it, Dominique. Um, I think it really depends on what the goals become for the harm reduction movement, you know? And as safe supply is, is sort of taking center stage and decriminalization of people who use drugs, um, should we be successful in changing policy on, on that scale and ideally internationally, which is a tall order, then we are working ourselves out of a job. And I wish that that would be kind of the conclusion is that we have safe supply, you know, there are fewer harms related to drug use. And so we no longer need such expansive, beautiful programming. Don't get me wrong, it's awesome. But um, that it's just not, there's not as many risks with using drugs, there's less stigma. You know, when we work through all that stuff, yeah, we may, we may not have to be so hardcore about harm reduction. Thanks, Don Vinique. Shauna, do you want to answer to that? Sir? So the question is, what's next for harm reduction? Yeah, yes. what's next? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? Or what you... Well, my thoughts are we fund it. We get it funded without us having to fill out 250-word little slots to justify, uh, you, you know, like when there's so much evidence and stuff, just give us the money, let the community do what it needs to do. Um, so that would be one of my hopes. Um, but also that infrastructures, infrastructure and resources um, are built into rural and remote Indigenous and Northern communities, because harm reduction, like even when we, we're talking about safe, you know, opening up more safe consumption services, they're almost always in urban centers, which in Manitoba will do nothing for 50% of the population. And so if our, all of our investment goes into things like that, it, it's troublesome. But I also want to acknowledge, like one of the things that Dominique said was hard to find in the literature was participation of people who use drugs. And it might be hard to find in the literature because it, people who use drugs who have led harm reduction. So it's never had to be explicit that people who use drugs should be there. Um, it became explicit when health tried to steal harm reduction, like most harm reduction initiatives now are coming through a public health or health streams. And remember that healthcare system is racist and sexist and stigmatizing and all of those things for people who use drugs. So harm reduction shouldn't be housed under health facilities, they should be housed with people who use drugs. And so even if we're thinking of safe consumption services, um, I keep on saying, how are we going to support the current safe consumption spaces? Because there's a whole bunch of 
informal safe consumption spaces in our province. And so we could, it'd be cheaper if we just support those spaces versus building one safe consumption site in Winnipeg, maybe. So I don't know, I think it needs to be led by people who use drugs. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Est-ce que Chantal ou Guillaume voudraient intervenir là-dessus sur le futur de la réduction des méfaits ou comment vous voyez ça? Ou... Um, ben, J'ai pas après, Chantal, ce, après ce que Chouane vient de dire, je pense que je peux juste seconder puis appuyer. Nous, on, nous on, on le prouve à chaque jour avec Métadam puis avec Profane que c'est euh, quand les usagers sont au cœur de. La, des services au, à tous les niveaux que les services fonctionnent vraiment ou les projets fonctionnent vraiment. C'est nous qui savons les besoins réels, puis et on n'a pas besoin de faire une étude, on n'a pas besoin de... On le sait, nous, on peut le dire directement. Déjà, sauter plein d'étapes, puis aller directement à faire quelque chose de concret. Moi, je suis tout le temps en train de vouloir faire quelque chose de concret. Je suis allé faire des comités, des révisions, des... On a besoin, il y a plein de choses qu'on sait déjà, il faut passer à l'action parce que les gens, ils meurent, les gens ont des mauvaises conditions de vie, les gens vivent plein de choses qui pourraient être corrigées assez facilement si on passait tout de suite à l'action en ayant impliqué directement à tous les niveaux les personnes concernées. C'est tellement logique et simple, mais comme je dis tout le temps, quand c'est trop simple. <rire> mais bref, je pense que c'est déjà commencé. Moi, je sens vraiment... Ça fait quand même une vingtaine d'années, euh, je suis mon âge, mais ça fait vraiment une vingtaine d'années, j'étais impliquée euh, dans les milieux communautaires, etc. Puis euh, je vois vraiment que les usagers, euh, on leur laisse de plus en plus de place, que maintenant, c'est vraiment le moment pertinent pour foncer, la porte est ouverte. Puis là, il faut les, faut les impliquer à tous les niveaux qu'on peut parce qu'il y a de la place maintenant. Donc, euh, je pense qu'on est dans un, un bon tournant pour qu'il y ait plein de choses qui se réalisent. Super. Tout à fait. Guillaume, tu veux-tu rajouter oui. quelque chose? Ben oui, je vais je aller un peu plus loin que ben moi, je, je, je suis d'avis, en tout cas, je partage l'avis de tout le monde, mais je dirais qu'il faut oser. Il faut oser, là. Il faut, il faut arrêter de... Oui, il faut en parler, il faut réfléchir, il faut avoir tout cet aspect-là, mais là, il faut oser. Là. Il faut passer à l'action, mais, mais, mais aller au-delà de l'action, oser. Exemple, je, je veux juste contextualiser avec Profane. Quand il est arrivé l'histoire de la COVID, là, nous autres, on était, bon, OK, un programme de formation provincial en présentiel, puis on n'était pas capable de repartir, on ne savait pas trop quoi faire. Là, euh, l'ensemble de nos formateurs étaient à l'arrêt. Donc, nous, on a dû s'adapter à ça. Donc, qu'on a dit, on va, euh, on, va, on va les faire travailler pareil, là. On, va être, on va leur faire faire d'autres choses. Donc, on avait des gens qui n'avaient pas Internet, qui n'avaient pas d'ordinateur, qui n'avaient aucune compétence informatique, qui n'avaient euh, qui pas de cellulaire, qui n'avaient pas... Donc, on a fait des, des, des petites capsules, euh, on leur a appris comment s'utiliser un Zoom, on leur a donné un ordinateur. Moi, je suis allé dans chaque maison, là, pas un ordi, là, à, aux personnes. Donc, on était vraiment dans, dans quelque chose de nouveau. Puis au début, ça a été même notre CA, là, on est un organisme par repos, même notre conseil d'administration, c'est là, ouais, mais là, vous allez donner des ordinateurs, des personnes qui prennent des drogues, vous là, mais ouais, puis s'ils vont le panner, que j'en ai à foutre, ils vont en acheter un autre. Enfin, <rire> tu sais, quoi, là, tu sais, pourquoi vous avez, tu sais, fait que ta, ça va tellement loin, la, la, le jugement, la stigmatisation, c'est ancré dans tout. Dans tout le monde, puis même nous qui travaillons là-dedans, on doit toujours se remettre en question, puis dire Oh, attention, j'ai tu. Tu sais, il faut, faut se remettre en cause dans tout ça. Là. Donc, puis, euh, mais oser, oser des choses. Puis, avec Profane, c'est ce qui est arrivé. On a osé, on, a, on fait des formations d'une journée complète, là, de 9 h le matin à 4, à 4 h après-midi. Les gens, ils restent, là. ils sont là toute la journée, puis ils sont contents, puis à la fin, ils nous parlent, puis ils ne s'en vont pas. Là. <rire> fait, que, fait que vraiment, c'est ça. Oui, c'est des beaux mots de fin, ça. Oser, j'aime vraiment beaucoup ça, euh, clairement. Euh, it's already the end, hein? I'm sorry, uh, Rebecca, I took over a little bit the end of the, the, the thing, but uh, I would like to hear maybe last words or des derniers mots uh, de votre expérience ou de qu'est-ce que, y a-t-il quelque chose que vous n'avez pas dit? Is there something you did not say that you want to absolutely say before we go and say bye to everybody that has stuck with us to the end of this uh, presentation? Sorry, Sophie, I spoke both languages. That must have mixed her up a little bit. I'm really sorry about that. I do that. I have a tendency to do that sometimes. So last words. 
<laughs> <You're> good. <laughs> Who wants to start? Okay, I'm gonna just name somebody. Uh, Dominique. She has a lovely little baby. <laughs> um, I don't really feel like I have too many last words. Actually, I think that okay. everything has been covered really in in good depth. Um, yeah. Sorry, we didn't have more time for Q and A, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Chantal. C'est pareil. Je veux juste remercier les gens d'avoir euh, de nous avoir réunis, euh, tous euh, les, les participants, les présentateurs. Puis, euh, ben, j'espère que les gens ont appris quelque chose, pour, euh, que ça a été euh, intéressant pour eux. Super. Guillaume. Ben oui, merci beaucoup pour ça, parce que moi, c'est toujours, euh, je trouve ça toujours très inspirant. On a besoin, pour pouvoir oser, on a besoin d'inspiration. Puis moi, de voir un projet comme Shohan, elle a fait euh, dans le au Manitoba, là, un network, là, un reduction network for peers. Là. Moi, je trouve ça vraiment intéressant, puis c'est quelque chose qu'on voudrait peut-être inclure dans notre profane, là, parce que nous autres aussi, les pères sont au cœur de tout ça. Donc, de pouvoir s'inspirer d'autres de, 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 initiatives, il y a des gens qui ont déjà osé, qui ont mis en place des choses, puis on n'est pas obligé, comme Chantal disait, il y a plein d'affaires qui existent, là. il faut juste les mettre en, en pratique. Euh, puis, euh, merci à Dominique aussi d'avoir... Euh, de nous avoir remis sur la voie là, de, la, de, la, de, la, de, la, de la réduction des méfaits. Là, parce qu'on euh, avait une petite discussion là, de les questions euh, answer, là, puis on avait euh, on, on parlait -tu des concepts, c'est une philosophie, puis on était là-dedans. Là. Mais tu sais, c'est bon, ça, tu sais, ça, ça revive, ça, ça nous questionne, ça nous repositionne par rapport à tout ça. Puis je pense qu'on doit constamment faire ça, malgré le fait qu'on travaille dedans jour, euh, jour après jour. Absolument. Shana? Um, I'm, I thank you, everybody. This was really great. Um, I'm my last words are just our campaign. I love someone who uses drugs. I love a lot of people who use drugs, and I love a lot of people who died in the war on drugs um, and continue to die in the war on drugs. And so I will end it with that. Thank you, Shauna, for saying those words. And Rebecca, would you like to say a last word, and then we will go? And I, I would like the panelists to stay. But uh, we, because we'll have a little wrap up, but uh, I'll let Rebecca say the last word. I'm just really grateful for everyone sharing their experiences here and their ideas and their work. Guillaume, I'm, uh, I love how you say we have to dare. And I think, you know, during this time of COVID, during this, you know, confluence of different public health crises, um, remembering the, the individuals, and uh, finding new ways to work together. And that always means going back to where harm reduction started, which is with communities of people who use drugs and um, making sure that we listen, that we engage involved justly, not, you know, not just meaningfully, but also justly, uh, I think is, is really important. And I'm excited to see that that work is happening more and more and we need to just keep that going. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Take care. We'll see you at a next stimulus that will be uh, in February, and it's going to be about harm reduction and prison, in prisons. So uh, that's the next subject of the webinar, and I think the one for Connect will be uh, drug sellers. So we'll be talking about that yeah, on, on January 20th, and me, it's going to be in February, but I'm not sure about if it's 24th, 23rd, but anyways. In February, we're talking about harm reduction in prisons. So take care and see you guys uh, next time and have a, a nice, beautiful day wherever you are.